Good evening, my name is Bruce Dedman. I am sitting in as the chair of the commission this evening as the chair and vice chair are not able to be here. Uh, with us, we have Rachel Leffler, Jason Dorney, and Alex Hoare for, and as commissioners, Dave Zomek and Aaron Jacques as staff. Um, this is being recorded. And because I have never done this before and then with this group, I'm gonna rely heavily on Aaron's advice and and um, uh, giving me the steps I'm supposed to take if I miss anything. Um, so please bear with me as I, I try to do this. Uh, this is, I said it was being recorded. This is the meeting of November 13th, 2024 of the Con Amherst Conservation Commission. Uh, and I guess the first thing on the agenda then is the chair's report. Um, I don't believe that Michelle had a chair's report uh, that she wanted to give, but there are two points, uh, which uh, the schedule going forward that Aaron is going to describe to us, and then I'm going to add two more points. Aaron? Yes. So um, our second meeting in November falls the day before Thanksgiving. So um, that's November 27th. So that meeting is going to be canceled. Uh, but to try to compensate for that and work around the December holiday, um, we're going to be having uh, our meetings in December on the 4th and the 18th. Um, in January, we're going to be returning back to um, our second and fourth Wednesday of the month schedule. Um, and then the other um, item was that there was a drought declaration declared as of October 1st, 2024. So um, that's just for the public's information and it does impact the commission's ability to um, confirm certain resource areas um, uh, during the, the drought declaration. So just as an FYI. Okay. Um, I also call everyone's attention to the lead headline article in today's Daily Hampshire Gazette, indicating that Amherst, among a number of other towns, have sent a letter to the state government in its many different departments and forms, seeking um, a share of the uh, $100 million that uh, plausibly could come to Western Massachusetts towns and counties to do work on uh, rivers and uh, wetlands. So I call your attention to the article and encourage you to read it. Uh, let's see, Dave, do you have a um, uh, report for this evening? Sure, I know it's a big agenda tonight. I'll be very brief. A couple of quick updates for the commission and for the public. <clears throat> uh, with the weather we've been having, the dry weather, um, it has afforded us the opportunity to continue some of the trail work at Hickory Ridge. Our contractor, Taylor Davis, who did the uh, some of the original work out there, all permitted through through the commission in that uh, original NOI. Um, they have been hard at work continuing the Crushed Stone Trail across the Fort River on the north side of the Fort River as planned. Um, so they've done great work. They're, they're nearing completion on that. We, we frankly need a little rain for that hard pack to set up. And once it sets up, it really doesn't go anywhere. It's, it's, it's very solid. So we're excited that that work got done. We had no idea they would be able to fit it into their schedule and they they were able to. Um, that leaves us with uh, some work in the spring. Uh, we might even get the bridge cross, across the uh, Fort River near the, the old clubhouse done uh, in the next two, two and a half months, weather depending. And then that would leave us the section of the trail between the former, uh, the, the old clubhouse and that main bridge uh, that we're gonna bring people across. So getting exciting out there, we'll have some sort of a kickoff, as I've said, and some sort of a ribbon cutting probably in May, early June of next year. Um, let's see, Hickory Demo, um, the old clubhouse, which I'm sure everybody loves to drive by and look at how beautiful it is. Uh, we are uh, just about ready to put that out to bid. So. Um, we have all the estimates for removing asbestos and, and such in the building, and uh, we're working with our um, procurement office to get the rest of that out to bid, and we expect some competitive bids on that. So with all any luck, we could remove that building, say, in January. 
early February, and it's probably about a two week job and it's done. So that would be very exciting. Okay. Um, and then lastly, yep. yeah, lastly, we'll be kicking off, Aaron and I will be kicking off working with our designer uh, consultant on the Puffer Spawn Dam and Dyke uh, work for repairs to, to those two structures. And I believe that kickoff is coming up here, Aaron. I'm sure it's on our schedules. I don't remember exactly when, but I think it's in the next two weeks. So we're still chugging along, lots of projects, and hopefully more exciting news uh, in the months to come. So th those are all my quick updates. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of minutes if any of the commissioners have a question for Dave. All right. Um, hearing none. Maybe we can move on to the land management updates. Um, maybe we could take the subcommittee first and then do the application second. Is that all right? Okay. Alex, I yield the, the floor to you. Okay. Uh, this evening, we're going to take a vote on the mission statement that was distributed to all of you um, a while ago. And that's pretty straightforward. Uh, some of the words in that mission statement are included in the appendices and the definitions, uh, just for clarification. So uh, we'll look forward to that vote. And then we have three documents in the folder for your review and comment and vote in the future. Um, they are in order, uh, uh, conservation land rules and regulations. They are brief. Um, I'd say terse, and it's just a list. <clears throat> and so um, looking for comments on that. Then we have an appendix which is evolving, and it's now up to G, A through G. And um, thank you, Rachel, for helping me work out some of the details on getting some of that stuff in there. Um, and then we have a memo which is in draft form which is from the subcommittee to Dave, and it has to do with dogs on the conservation land. And it is a, um, a statement first about dog issues, and then a list of administrative tasks or strategies that a group of us um, on the subcommittee um, thought might be worthwhile documenting and sending on to Dave. And you can read them, but those ideas, frankly, came about as we went around Wentworth Farm and we were standing there kind of chewing the fat and what kinds of things would be helpful in terms of keeping an eye on bridges and needs for repair and keeping in mind that short that staff is short. And um, I think there's some creative ideas in that memo, one of which was to create a um, citizen group um, that would take on some work and that's descri described in that memo. So please give that a look and let us know what your ideas are. And then I'll ask for in the future, your vote on whether or not uh, that can be sent. So three items for you to look at and comment on and one item to vote on tonight. Thank you. Any questions? Can I, add one, can I add one more thing, Bruce? Yeah, yeah. So no, before the subcommittee, this is a heads up for commissioners. Uh, before the subcommittee right now, there's all, all the other policies that we uh, are not going to bring to you one at a time. And it, it we're asking them to go through them. We're going to talk about them on the 19th. And then hopefully it'll come to you. And uh, that'll take a while to go through. That'll be kind of a major work item. But it's a strategy to get us all done in December and make the end of uh, the year deadline to be done with all this policy stuff. So look forward to that. And um, okay, we'll, we'll talk about that the next time we meet and, and we hand it off to you. So just as a, as a member of the subcommittee, I will add that it's really helpful for the people who are not on the subcommittee to take a look at these because we're so close to it. I mean, at some point we just, 
we need somebody to help us. So it's really valuable. And between me and Aaron, we're going to contact the people, the other commissioners who are not here tonight, strongly encourage them to read this and get get comments back to us because it, it is extremely uh, valuable. Thank you. So okay. if we, could we move to the vote now? And the mission, sure. the mission statement, um, where would that be in our packet this week? Is it last week, last meeting's packet? Is that yeah. what? Okay. Yeah. So, Aaron, is it correct that because there's a motion, we should see if there's any public comment first? Or is that only for hearings? Um, well, it's a it's a public meeting right now um, where we will be, you know, it really it's at your discretion as the chair. If okay. you want to take any public comment on it, you're welcome to. Um, Let's just see if anyone has a comment at, about the subcommittee and the things that are here. And, and you can tell whether someone raises their hand, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so not seeing any public comment on that. We will come back to public comment on each hearing and at the end of the night. So there are other opportunities. Um, so I'd entertain a motion from one of the three other commissioners. I, I'm not in a position to do that. I, I move to approve the mission statement as presented in the October 23rd meeting. Uh, Rachel, on um, is the motion, do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, any other comment before we vote? So, Alex? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I vote aye, okay. Yay. So, excellent. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, Alex is the chair of the subcommittee and I know how he feels. <clears throat> okay, because it's not 7.30 yet, we're gonna go to the end of the agenda and other business, correct, Aaron? Um, we, we also have, have a couple- um, oh, so Land sorry, use applications. Sorry. Yeah, the land use applications. Land use so, so at islands and stargazing. Uh, yes, so. Um, Aaron, could you present these two first, these land uh, conservation land use applications? Sure. Um, and tell us what we need to do about them. Yep. So um, these are both annual um, permits that the Conservation Commission issues. Um, the first one is uh, stargazing that a, um, uh, a group, that a, a private school group um, goes up and does uh, stargazing at Mount Pollux. Um, in the in the at nighttime, um, and then the other is a uh, um, saw wet owl bound, uh, banding program that Kestrel Land Trust puts on on an annual basis, um, and they uh, use the land at um, uh, Sweet Alice Conservation Area, which is adjacent to the Kestrel Land Trust headquarters. Um, so these are both um, annual programs. My understanding, so just to handle them separately, with the stargazing, um, our requirement is that they keep the permit on them um, when they have, when they're up there, they have to physically have it on them and in their car. Also that they um, have to notify the Amherst Police Department the evenings that they're going to be up there just to make sure that they're not, um, that, that the police department knows that they're there. Um, that has those have been pretty standard conditions. Um, um so is yeah. is there a member of the public here who is seeking this uh this application? So both of these applications came in today, very last minute. Um they were uh I think expecting not expecting to be on tonight because they okay. were so last minute, but because our second meeting in November is canceled, I uh, tacked them on to this meeting because both of the programs are proposed um either at the end of November or early December to begin. And do we need a separate motion for each or can we do them together? Um I think we can do them together. Um my recommendation would be that we approve them with the ongoing conditions that we've previously approved them with. Um, for the saw wet owl, the um, program, our, our requirement was that they have their required um, permit from Fish and Wildlife and also that they um, provide the results of the um, uh, banding program back to the Conservation Commission. Okay. 
Uh, Alex. I had a question on the uh, Sawat Owl banding. At the very end of the description, it says that uh, people will be able to observe the banding at the Kestrel headquarters, which is adjacent to Sweet Alice. But the banding's gonna, the nets are gonna be set on Sweet Alice. So it looked like the birds would be handled and, and held for a period of time and taken back to Sweet Alice, to the headquarters so that people could see the banding. I didn't quite understand why, if somebody wants to see banding happen, they are not out there at the nets. And it was a concern to me that the the animals are out in the evening seeking calories, food. And if they are held, it wasn't stated for how long. And um, if so, my concern was that there was nothing in this that says how long they're going to hold the owls. Yeah, and um, I know that they take some measurements, like some um, weight and um, measure the owls and, you know, assess their condition when they band them and take down some um, sort of uh, information about each of the owls um, for for research purposes, because everything that they collect, they're reporting back. Um, it's a great question, Alex. I, um, I don't yeah, so most of the time the animals will be put in a bag. Uh, that's what happens in bird banding. Other other kinds of bird banding, you put the bird in a bag, they mm -hmm. calm down because it's dark, and then they're put on a scale and weighed and all that kind of stuff. And all that can be done at the nets. And I, um, I would rather be cautious with the birds and minimize the amount of time they're held. You know, David, is your hand up? Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, a couple of things. You know, I, I, I think those are good questions, Alex, and we should ask um, Chris Valente um, to give us the answers to those questions. Um, I don't know the exact location of the nets. Aaron, was that included in the application or not? No, no. What we need to understand is that Sweet Alice Conservation Area surrounds the Kestrel Trust office. So yes. I, I don't think we should assume that the banding, I think the banding is actually happening, if I'm not mistaken, in the woods, not anywhere near the parking lot at Sweet Alice. So the distance between the woods and the the uh, the Kestrel office is quite small, quite short, versus anything out in the in the meadow near the parking lot. So just putting that out there. But I think um, you know the other thing is, I mean, including the public in banding operations is a very standard practice. It's been happening at Man um, Manamet Bird Observatory for you know fifty years. So. I think getting the times, uh, rough approximate times of how long the birds will be um, uh, uh, kept before being released, my my best guess is that they're keeping them as long as it takes to take the measurements, ban the birds, show them to people, say a few things about their life uh, histories, et cetera, and then they're released. But we can get that information from Chris Valente. I yeah, will. Well, I, I have. I've banded birds and bats both. And um, okay, yeah. I, I also want to say I just want to add that you know Kestrel, their staff, and the people they have on here are expert bird banders who have been doing this for okay. years. So I just well, what I'm hearing is that assuming there's not some time sensitivity as to when this happens, we can get this information. We can bring it back to the next meeting and and give them their permit at that time. I think there may be time sensitivity. I think the program actually is supposed to happen uh, when no, pretty soon. But Dave, it does specifically say that people will be able to observe the banding at the headquarters. And my question is, why can't they observe it at the nets and minimize the length of time that the animals are held? Rachel? Yeah, I'm, I'm reading through their application. Um, I read a couple times 
it, it goes quickly. Um, so it sounds like there's a period of time, December 23rd through 2nd, that they're going to do banding at night on an upland trail. And it sounds like they're doing the banding at the location that they're netting with a, um, someone who holds federal and state master banding permits. There is a chance on one of those days that they would have a banding demonstration at Kestrel Land Trust's office. Um, and then it says that the other events that there would be this um, master banding person and one to two volunteers on the trail. For right. Visitors. And so, one, one operates on a sub permit. Yeah. So Alex, do you want any additional words to be put in this permit or? Well, with all due respect to expert banders, they're not without impacts. And uh, uh, just because they're doing research doesn't mean they can't af negatively affect the birds. So the answer is, yeah, I'd like some clarity and and I'd like the birds to be minimized, the minimum, I like the length of time that they're held to be minimized so that they're if it's the case, Alex, and I understand, my recommendation would be to simply put that as a condition in your your authorization to do the work. I would I would hate to hold them up. I think they're doing good work. Okay. They're professionals, but you could put in the commission voted in favor of this with the specific, you know, uh, condition that uh, you know uh, holding the birds in hand is minimized, and that observations of banding be taken take take place at the nets. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, Any objection to that change that, that Aaron would put into the the application uh, um, permit and and rules? And Aaron, you feel like you have what you need from that? So I, I would ask for a motion just on this one. We'll divide them up. So a, a motion to approve the uh, land use application for Annual Northern Saw Wet Owl Netting and Public Demonstration, CLU 2417. Um, is there a motion to do that? I so move. And is there a second? I'll second. And is there any public comment? Okay. Um, the vote then, uh, Jason? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm also an aye. I have a closing comment. Okay, and then we want to go back to the stargazing. Just a closing comment. Uh, Aaron, if we get some pushback on that, if there's good reason why they don't want people tromping through the woods to the nets, we can always make an adjustment with their um, justification and explanation. But so I'd rather do okay. it that way than... Right. Okay. No, I agree that that's a good, you know, tell them what we would really like to see, and then we'll see if there's any uh, change in their view. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the land use application for annual stargazing in Mount Pollux, uh, CLU 2416? So moved. Uh, do I have a second? Uh, I second. Is there any public comment? All right, um, we'll have the vote. Uh, Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. I vote aye. Okay, it's uh, 726. So let's see if there's anything we could do in four minutes at the end. Um, Aaron, we have enforcement compliance updates, order of conditions. Um, we could do that one because there's no quorum. What? How do we do the? I'm looking at the end of the. Uh, there are other business, 31 Southeast Street. We can't. We don't have a quorum for the vote on this. What do you recommend? So um, why don't I burn through other business really quickly? Um, our first hearing is going to be continued anyways. So if we All start right. it a few Fair minutes enough. late, we can just jump right into the second hearing too. Okay. Um, so um, in your in your packets um, under enforcement, you'll see that there was a complaint um, about some work along the Norawatic Rail Trail. Um, 
this was reported um, a couple of weeks ago to me, and I immediately made contact with DCR about it um, when it came into our office. And um, I've been trying to get some additional information on it before we take response action. And the reason for that, um, and if you sort of read through the correspondence with DCR, it might give you a better sense of that, but the commission's response typically would be, um, you know, an enforcement um, related order. And if we issue enforcement, there are a couple different options that we could take there. One of them is to tell the owner to remove the access road and restore the area. Um, the other might be to require them to file an after the fact permit um, to permit the activity that they conducted. Um, I feel like we need to operate a little bit in um, cooperation with DCR on this because um, it's unclear and DCR is currently working with their um, the state attorneys to determine whether or not um, the activity is is legally permittable based on um, you know the right of way access to that location. So the point being, if we ordered them to take it out and then DCR came along and said, oh no, they're allowed to legally have this, um, we're kind of coming in with mixed messaging versus if they come in and say, um, you know, if we, or if we told them to permit it, go through the permitting process and then they say, oh no, it needs to be removed. Um, so I wanna make sure whatever action the commission takes is you know, a coordinated effort with, with the state's response. So I'm not asking the commission to take any action on this tonight. I mostly just wanted to share it with the commission so that you're aware of it. Um, the area is stable right now. It's a, a, a swale basically that runs along the, um, the Norwatic Trail, um, an area like a strip of, of BVW that runs along the edge of the trail that was impacted. Um, not disputing the fact that it needs to be dealt with, just trying to um, be cautious in how we respond. Any questions um, by commissioners on this particular one? I have a dumb question. No, no questions are dumb. Um, the Nawada Trail, that's a foot trail or bike trail, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the, what the size of the size of the of the action is big enough for a truck. Um, is somebody going to drive on the water trail? Well, this is part of the, the concern. You can right now, the way that it's constructed, they can drive, the owner could drive from their property directly onto the trail. There was also some rumblings about the this access road being continued on the other side of the trail. So um, that, Let, let's... <laughs> Let's let's not get too much in the detail. We need to wait for the state to make a determination before we take any action. But I recommend that we move on. Just trying to Unless, understand the context. Okay. Unless there's another question, um, what about Wildflower Drive? Just the um, surveyor was out on the site. Um, I've been really trying to get some additional information on that site in terms of when their anticipated submission date is, but they they have not been very responsive okay. so well that's at 7 31 i'm going to go back to the hearings and i just got to make sure i have the thing i'm supposed to read so you don't have to open this one bruce no i know but when we get there i want it in front of me anyway mm -hmm. it, there is a reminder to to all of you um that in each hearing where where, where the heck is it there we go uh, Aaron's put it up on the screen. There will be five minutes of comments from staff, five minutes from the applicant, five minutes for public comment, five minutes for conservation commissioners. And within the public comment, there is time for uh, the, uh, if there are any abutters to the project, they are allowed to go first. And we want to emphasize, given the change in the, the schedule, we want to emphasize the Commission requires all submitted and revised materials to be submitted by Wednesday of the week prior to the meeting. So a full week ahead of those revised dates, uh, it's necessary to give us anything that, that you want to see 
in the in the meeting. So please uh, raise your hand if you don't have the floor, and um, I will try to facilitate the communication as best I can. So hearing number one, uh, notice of intent, Goddard Consulting LLC on behalf of U Drive Amity LLC for the demolition of two existing structures and associated infrastructure and construction of a proposed mixed use development consisting of two buildings with associated parking, landscaping and stormwater improvements at 25 to 35 University Drive and 422 Amity Street Map 13B, lots 18, 27, 28, and 54. So um, the applicant has requested a continuance of the public hearing until December 4th. Um, Aaron, is there anything additional that you should add, you want to add as the staff? Uh, I met with the applicant to, um, you know, basically discuss uh, potential revisions. And so they're working to adjust the plans to um, come back with some revisions for the commission, but they didn't have an opportunity to to do that in time for the meeting tonight. Okay. And is there is there anybody from the applicant here this evening? Um they well they they submit a they submitted a written request to continue. So um I don't think that they had anticipated being present to okay. propose or anything or to is present. It, is there anybody, a member of the public who has a, a comment or a question about this particular hearing? Please raise your hand so we'll, we'll let, we can bring you in. Okay, seeing none, are there any commissioner comments on this? Okay, hearing none, um, I'll, I would accept a motion. I move to continue the public hearing to December 4, 2024, at 7.40 p.m. I have a second. I second that. Okay. Uh, the vote, Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I vote aye. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to the next hearing. At 7.35, this is SLR International Corporation on behalf of the town of Amherst for the improvements to the Amherst Regional High School track and field facilities and associated site work at 21 Mattoon Street, map 11D, lots 81, 270, and 215. Um, my understanding, is it correct that we do not have a quorum for this? Alex? I need to recuse myself from this, so I'm going to turn off my camera. And when okay. you're done, I'll come back. OK. Yes. Um... So that means we don't have a quorum. Uh, a quorum would be we would be required to have four commissioners Correct. Uh, who could vote. Are there any members of the public here who were here for this one? No, I'm not seeing the list. So here, and I'm relying on that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing anyone. Okay, so we don't have a quorum, therefore we can't vote on anything. So what is the other step that we take, if any? So um, really our only option is just to continue. Um, and so um, my recommendation to the commission is that we um, uh, just continue the public hearing to uh, December 4th at uh, okay. 7 50 p.m. Okay then that's what's going to happen because we can't vote on it even on a continuance. <laughs> Correct yes okay. we just we just announce a date certain that the hearing will be continued to which will be December 4th at 7 50 p.m. and at that time um, that's when the commission will okay. be able to, to take action on it. Okay. Let's see. Um, I do see someone with their hand up, Bruce. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, um, I did have another comment. I don't want to hold up the applicant um, with uh, with comments they might need to address before the in, before the next meeting. I don't want to sit on those comments. What's the best way? Should I bring that up here, or should I write that to you, Erin? What, what's the best way? Um, if you could send an email to me, Rachel, and I'll forward it on to the applicant. Okay, great. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so I, we have three minutes before the next hearing. Is it, yes. you wanna do something different or just take a break or? How, um, how we... I, I think we could we could handle the, the um, final other business item. Um, okay, well, let's get Alex back in here then. Yep. <clears throat> Alex, we've got a little extra time before the next hearing. We're going to go to, to other business part two. So um, the uh, Emily Dickinson uh, carriage house project is underway. They've, they have a licensed applicator that they've engaged to um, assist them with completing their invasive species management plan. Um, in the course of beginning the invasive species management plan, they discovered three additional um, Norway maples, which are located in the wetland area um, within the invasive species management area. They'd like to remove those Norway maples as they're in there doing the removal of the additional invasives. And in an overabundance of caution, they've reached out to us to make sure that the commission is okay with the removal of those um, Norway maples as part of the um, invasive species management plan, which I'm completely in favor of, but um, just want to pass it by the board before I um, give any green lights to them. Any thoughts on that? <clears throat> are there any members of the public who have a thought about that or who are in a butter to the Emily Dixon Carriage House project? Okay. Uh, Rachel. I just want to remind everyone I have to recuse myself from this project. So. But I don't think we're going to have a vote. We're just, okay. I'm, I'm testing whether anybody has an objection to Aaron going back to them and saying, especially since it's so dry, this is the perfect time to take those trees out. Okay, we'll do, so, so will, she will do that. Now we're going to go back to hearing number three. This is Notice of Intent, Niche Engineering on behalf of Wayfinders Incorporated. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because we don't have a quorum for this one. So we're not able to do anything. Um, Aaron, yes. can you explain why we do not have a quorum since sure. there are people here? Right. Um, so um, Rachel is not, my understanding, Rachel, you've re you're recusing yourself ah, um, right. from voting Absolutely. on the Wayfinders projects. Oh. Um, so as a result of that, we've only got three okay. members right. of the board who could vote on it. Um, and since we can't vote to continue it, I'll just announce for the record okay. that the public hearing will be continued to December 4th at 7.45 okay. p.m. But in keeping with our what we've been trying to do earlier in the meeting. Let's see if there are any members of the public who are interested in this one, have a question about it, are in a butter. Any public members who have a question on this one? Alex. Little humor. Could I speak Please? out of could I speak out of both sides of my mouth and make up for the fact that we don't have a quorum? Sure, why not? I didn't even crack a smile out of Aaron. There we go. Well, she's focused. She, uh, so, uh, in the area of humor, apparently Aaron's children know when it's meeting night, and they go out of their way to make her life difficult during the meeting and before the meeting, and they just know. So, yep. Uh, Murphy's law. So the next hearing is, is supposed to be at 7.55, which is a long time from now. What, what do we do in that situation, or is that a typo? Um, Should have been 7.45, since the one before was 7.40? Uh, I believe that is a typo. Um, let me just double check, though. Because... I don't want to have anybody who's here. Oh, I'm sorry. I went to five instead of four. My error. Just a minute. Got to find four. Oh, dear. Where the heck is it? No, you you are right. Um, I think oh, it's, it's, you, it's you 750. Are it's still a long time from now. So yeah. 
No, you're right. Um, let me just let me just double check on the agenda if you guys could give me just one second. Sure. Number three was seven forty. Number four is four at seven fifty. And probably that's because we anticipated needing the time, and then all of a sudden we couldn't use it. So. Yeah, sometimes um, because I use it, you know, I reuse the template. Sometimes the the times get a little um, wonky, but. Just... Well, this is a this is an in, a valuable and interesting one, and I'm concerned that we not get ahead of the schedule that other people. Um, yeah. Do the public do the members of the public know the times when there's on here? Yes, and it, it's posted on the agenda. So it, I think what what happened was there was just in the course of our continuation. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I do try to do the continuation so that we're five minutes apart, just in case we run into a situation like this yeah. that we're not sitting for a long time. But um, it it does happen when hearings close or, you know. The... Well, let's try this. Let's, uh, um, as the chair, I'm going to propose that we hear the staff um, input and then make sure that when the hearing is opened, um that we check with the public several times to make sure that if they have any questions or any concerns that we uh, we get them addressed um but i don't see a way around just waiting for another seven minutes before we can start but alex do you have a thought yes a procedural question um if i was a member of the public and i wasn't going to tune in until the published time and I miss what Aaron had to say, I might be upset. Yeah, fair enough. No, so that's a good could you, could you ask if there's any members, well, even if you ask and they're not here now. Right, that, that's the problem. Yeah, um, I, I would defer to the schedule in honor of the okay. public. Then I'm going to propose we take a five minute break and come back at uh, 749. Um, have a cup of coffee or Anything else you want to do for the next few minutes? Just, and then we will start at 749. We'll call it officially a personal moment. Or something, yeah. So please come back in four minutes. Thank you. 
So, Aaron, do you see the member of the public with their hand raised? Jo Josna Ray Reg Rega? Yes. Okay, so how we should... Yeah, I mean, I think um, that her public comment is pertaining to the next hearing that's coming okay. up. So we should probably okay. open the hearing before we take her comment. Okay. <clears throat> Rachel, are you there? Yes, I just forgot to put on my video. Okay, so um, before we get started with the next hearing, I just would strongly, strongly encourage all of you to go outside after this meeting. The moon is quite extraordinary and you will, if you're in the right place, you can see Venus off in, on the eastern horizon. Okay, um, this is hearing number four, a notice of intent CDW Consultants, Inc., on behalf of the University of Massachusetts Building Authority for the construction and expansion of a regional ground source heat exchange system, including geothermal wells at parking lot 31 and underground piping heat recovery chillers and associated infrastructure within the existing utility plant at 110 North Service Road, map 8A and 8C, lots 46 and 13B, um, our notice does not note that the uh, Hadley Conservation Commission also has a, a small piece of jurisdiction of the project. So um, to remind everyone, and we do see um, at least one person from the public with their hand raised, um, we're going to take the, if there are applicants present, we'll take their presentation first for five minutes, public comment for five minutes, and then commission comments and questions, and then we'll see about entertaining a motion. Uh, Aaron, before we start, is there any staff uh, input that we should know? Um, yes. So um, since the last meeting, so I, I, I did issue a memo um, prior to the last meeting. Um, I met with the applicants um, uh, since the last meeting to review my recommended changes. Um, there are a, uh, a series of changes that were made to the plan, which I feel like make have made a significant um, water quality improvement and also um, uh, less impact to the wetland as a result of the adjustments that were made. So um, I want to make sure that the applicant has time to present those changes to the commission tonight. Um, 
but I've also drafted an order of conditions. Um, and so that is ready. And I've tried to condition that such that the commission has some um, uh, ability to ensure that there are additional water quality um, considerations during construction. This one was a particularly tricky one to, to permit for a variety of reasons, um, primarily because um, a lot of the uh, sort of uh, construction phase um, of the project wasn't yet determined as a result of not having a contractor selected. Um, so I did try to fashion the order of conditions to take that into consideration so that we would have a little more control during the construction. Um, just for the commission's um, information, uh, there was quite a bit of public comment that came in on this. Um, there was comments that came in immediately prior to our last meeting with um, a series of questions, many of which really weren't relevant to the Conservation Commission. Um, there were some questions relative to, um, you know, protection of water quality and protection of wetlands. So um, I'd like for the for the applicants representative to review their changes, but there are um, quite a few additional um, comments that um, I'm hopeful that the university will address with these um, abutters because uh, it, it seems like some basic sharing of information could resolve their concerns or at least um, put their minds at ease potentially. So anyways, um, that's just a little bit of background, but I'll um, stop now. And okay. Is there someone from the applicant here? Yes, and um, anybody who wants to join the group can raise their hand and I'll pull you in. Seeing quite a few people raising their hands. I'm hopeful these are all project proponents. Good evening. Aaron, there's one other person, uh, Jim Boudreau, if you could um, advance him to a panelist also. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so again, remember that the schedule is five minutes for the presentation from the applicant, and then there'll be five minutes for public comment, and then anything from the commission. Great. Uh, thank you again for having us. I am Jason Venditti from UMass. I have with me tonight presenting uh, the two lead consultants on the project, Jim Boudreau from RFS and Eric Wilhelmsen from CDW. Uh, most of the presentation will be uh, completed by them. And again, we appreciate Aaron's time working with us in regard to design reviews and iterations to get to the point where we've furthered the design enough for this commission to re-engage in the conversation. So we appreciate that. Uh, one other note um, would be that we did indeed go through the Hadley Conservation Commission last night and did receive approval contingent upon approval tonight to have the orders and conditions overlap. And I appreciate that that um, handshake in regard to both towns has been um, actually very beneficial for all of us, we think so. Uh, with that being said, I will hand it over to Eric mostly to uh, take you through the nuts and bolts of the revisions since the last time you guys have seen it and look forward to your comments. Um, I share my screen? Yes, I've enabled you, so you should be able oh, to share. Okay. Okay, so just to quickly go over the changes. Um, we had a stormwater detention pipe and a water quality unit up in, up in this area. We shifted those down to the, I guess that's the northwest corner of the parking lot. The detention pipe here, a new water quality unit here, which is larger than last time. We called out for this curb along this corner to be an eight inch high vertical granite curb just to help with any water that may be jumping over the curb and you know, force all the water through the catch basins into the storage system and also out through the water quality unit. We had an additional row of hay bales uh, around this corner and a little bit over on this little wetland part that sort of juts up towards the parking lot. We added some uh, erosion riprap at the ends of the existing discharge pipes to help with any scour. And we formalized the snow storage area in this corner where 
any of the stored snow that sits up here as it melts, it enters into this catch basin, connects back into the drainage system, goes through the water quality unit before it discharges back out to the wetlands. That's the quick rundown of the changes. Thank you. Um, let's see, Mr. Boudreau, I think it is. Yep. Is there more, more to add there? Uh, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's really it on the, on the stormwater side, J just so you understand the, the relationship between RFS engineering and CDW RFS is the, um, the prime consultant for the overall project and CDW consultant is the, is our, um, is our civil and permitting consultant for this particular piece of the project. Okay. I'll throw on one of the piece of information is that the existing catch basins that are to remain, uh, we did have the construction managers go out there and survey those and those are indeed deep sump so that also benefits the overall site's ability to manage stormwater which is good okay Karen I just wanted to add that um, in addition to the items that um, Eric presented I did ask and there's a note um, in the I guess it's the northwest um, side of the parking lot this? to do some stabilization measures um, in the area where the existing catch basin um, that's been intercepting most of the flows. Um, it's the water that's coming down there has been jumping that curb and has caused some erosion. So there's a, a note there that there's going to be um, some um, uh loam, reseed, and erosion control blanket installed in that area to stabilize that location where that has been happening. Okay. So let's, if a commissioner has a question for the for the applicant, let's take that now, not comments. Just do you have a, a question you want to ask them to clarify something, Rachel? Yeah. Um, I, I'm looking at the plans and I wonder, Eric, if you could help um, explain the catch basin that's in that southwest corner that connects now to the stormwater um, treatment unit before did it have I think you mentioned in the last hearing that there were two outlets to it are you eliminating the outlet that goes to the south now is that all the water is now going to the north is that no I think you're talking about this catch basin here yeah so there's an existing 10 inch pipe that that comes out here uh -huh. the, the catch basin also was chained to this catch basin the manhole and then outlighted outletted to this one as well okay. we had talked about potentially removing this one but uh in discussions with aaron we did end up just cutting this one back because it seems to stick out from the embankment and just sort of be there's a section of pipe just sort of lying on the ground so it's okay. going to get cut back to the bottom of the slope and then provided with a, an erosion control um, impact basin <clears throat> scour hole prevention so some, I mean, some of the the line on the plan, with the drainage line connection to the manhole to the north of that basin, and some of that water go in that catch basin go back to the north. Yeah. So the this is this was put in, I assume, at some point as as a bit of an overflow, okay. but most of the flow in in you know smaller storms definitely does come back in, goes through the detention pipe, and then you know will be controlled by the outlet control structure before it goes through the water quality unit. And most of it is still coming out that pipe, the, uh, uh -huh. the main 24 inch is. So like heavier storms goes to, towards the west. Yep. Okay. Um, and then I had a question about what your feet per second is coming off of that riprap impact basin on the west side. Well, what about the impact basin? Uh, the one to the west where most of the water is going. Is that, yep. what is your feet per second coming off of that? Um. I don't recall it off the top of my head. I'll have to pull out the, okay. the yeah. drainage report, but I mean, we sized it based upon like a, a full volume of a flow coming out the pipe. Okay. Um, so whatever the velocity is, it's definitely getting reduced by the impact basin. All right. Any other questions by the commissioners before we go to public comment? Jason? Uh, I was looking for a detail for that um, detention pipe. I don't see one in there. Could you either direct It's just a, it's, it's a flat pipe. Um, it's not perforated or anything like that. It's just installed like a regular 
other HDPE pipe. We didn't put any particular special detail about it because it, it's just a 36 inch flat pipe. Okay. What makes a detention pipe versus then just a pipe? What, how's it qualifying as a detention pipe? So this manhole structure right here has, has a concrete weir mm -hmm. across it and with various sized orifices in that weir. So this structure here holds back the water in this pipe and then lets it slowly out through this outlet control structure, which then again feeds into the water quality structure. Okay, any other commissioner questions? I'd like to get members of the public to have an opportunity to uh, uh, ask questions, express concerns, make a comment. So Aaron, can you bring in people who have their hands raised? Sure. sure. Uh, Jasna, you should be able to speak. Thank you. If for the note takers, if you could give your address. Yes, uh, good evening. My name is Josna Reggae. I live on 96 Farview Way in District 1. Thanks Welcome. To, thanks to Erin, thank you. And thanks to Erin for all her prompt and helpful responses to my email exchanges with her. And yes, the moon is gorgeous tonight. I'm a resident of the Farview neighborhood, which abuts the proposed heat exchange system and geothermal well field, which will apparently, to our knowledge, or in terms of what we've been told, will consist of 70 wells, each 800 feet deep, located in UMass parking lot 31. Our group believes that the well field should not abut any residential neighborhood. However, most of our concerns are outside the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission, as Erin pointed out, so we will not raise them here. We trust that the Commission has scrutinized the proposal before you to ensure that it meets all the relevant standards, including mass DEP standards for geothermal drilling, that it will use non-toxic materials should any leaks develop, and that it has built in, ha has built in safety mechanisms and provisions for periodic checks. Today, I would like to make three points, though. First, to register a complaint about the notice to abutters. My husband and I found our notice of your October 9th hearing only yesterday when we were recycling what we thought was junk mail. There was a letter addressed to each of us from a CDW consultants in Framingham, a company we had never heard of, with no indication on the outside of the envelope that it was a notice of an upcoming public hearing. I suspect that several of our neighbors who are sure that they never received notification may have discarded the letter as junk mail. Whenever I've received a notice to abutters in the past, it has been sent by the relevant town board or committee, not by an unknown outside contractor. The second point I want to put on the record regards the scope of the project. We have learned just by our own digging that UMass's plans for the North Amherst Energy Exchange Center are not limited to 70 wells on lot 31, but include all three parking lots down the hill along Governor's Drive, 26, 31, and 68. On the map of the area in, a, in an appendix to the UMass capital plan, the three lots are marked as follows, quote, geothermal well field for CSL and CSEL buildings, 100 wells proposed, 175 wells maximum build out, end quotes. As a butters, we have not been apprised of the extent of this project. We feel that UMass is withholding the full scope of its geothermal project from the community by proceeding in this piecemeal manner. This does not reflect transparency, a meaningful communication process, or an attempt to get community buy-in. From a community that is predisposed to approve and welcome a project that leads the university toward net zero um, carbon emissions. Finally, just a quick question. After the permit has been granted and work is underway, Unforeseen problems may threaten the surrounding ground or surface water. I would like to know whether there's a mechanism for the commission to call for work to be halted temporarily if any such problems should arise. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, comments and the question. Erin, can you 
um, answer the question directly now, or is it take? Uh, I believe you have the answer, so let's see what you have to say. Yes, would it be possible to take down the share um, screen sure. for a minute so we can see each other? Sorry. There um, we go. Thank you. Um, so, yes, so, um, I and I can pull up the draft order of conditions so that the commission can see it, but um, to um, Jasna's point, one of the one of the conditions is that the um, project must comply with the DEP guidelines for geothermal wells. Um, but in addition to that, there is um, monitoring that's required throughout the process. Um, and uh, that includes monitoring of the stormwater structures, monitoring of the erosion controls. There's also um, several um, uh, issues which have to be um, the contractor will have to check in with staff on primarily dewatering. So as part of the geothermal well drilling process and also just dealing with stormwater on a um, construction site where you have exposed soils, there's going to be situations where there's either drilled material and sort of water and tailings that's coming off of that drilled um, uh, area, as well as um, stormwater that's coming off the site. And so um, they're going to have to uh, basically come to staff with what their proposal is for that dewatering, and I'll have to review and approve that as well as inspect it um, when it's um, underway to, to begin. Um, and so typically with a um, uh, the geothermal well process, it's a series of what they call frack tanks, which are essentially um, dump lined dumpsters, which um, water from the process is pumped into the dumpsters and then um, uh, there are um, uh, flocculants which are put into that um, if necessary in order to settle out the solids from the water so that um, clean water can be discharged and the, the other material can be um, taken off site. So there, yes, there's a series of checks and balances once the permit is issued to ensure that they are um, uh, doing things responsibly and that um, no dirty water is gonna be um, discharged from the site. Is it not correct that there are also, for each of the phases, there are pre-construction meetings with you and that there are inspection logs that are required periodically throughout the, the, the process of the thing. And then in perpetuity, there is some measure of, of um, management oversight. I, I'm going to go to the in perpetuity part, but I think there was something in there that said, uh, where is it? All right, additional um, alterations are prohibited and that they um, would have to come back to the commission if any changes were uh, being contemplated. Correct, yep. Yep, and, and there will be a pre-construction meeting where we, we meet with the contractor on site, um, as well as the, um, the inspector, the person who's doing the, the erosion and sediment control and the stormwater inspections. Um, so, and that's also an opportunity for me to inspect the erosion and sediment controls to make sure that they're functioning before work starts. Okay. Um, are there any other members of the public who have a question or a comment? We can take one or two more briefly. I don't see any other hands. Um, now, do the commissioners have comments or any other question that's come up in the meantime? Rachel. Um, thank you for talking us through all the different checks that this, this project will have. Um, I have a question about the dewatering franking tanks. Um, you know, or is there a, any sort of control over the amount of water that's released, like over what period of time so that we're not flooding the downstream wetland areas, you know, causing erosion or are there any rules related to that or how that's approached? Yes. So the answer is it depends. Um, so like I'll give you an example. So in the case of Amherst College, they're actually in their frack tanks. They're getting special permission from the town to discharge into the town's sewer system. And they're testing the water to make sure that it's clean and free of any 
you know, toxins or contaminants before it's released into the sewer system. And then once it goes in the sewer system, it goes through the town's sewer, normal sewer procedure where it's cleaned before it comes out as, you know, potable water. Um, so I don't, the answer is to your question, we don't know yet what they're doing with that water because um, we haven't really received details. But what I can tell you is um, for a project of this magnitude, it would be really um, unusual to be discharging the water from those frac tanks on site. Um, if it was, um, it would need to be a pretty significant um, uh, uh, stabilized area where the, you know, water was being, clean water was being pumped out of these frac tanks into an upland area, which was fully stabilized, um, basically an infiltration, a constructed infiltration basin to receive that water um, so that it would be slowly infiltrated into the ground. But again, you know, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Um, it you know, we kind of would have to cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, so just that's the best answer I can give at this point. Yeah, that's great, especially since groundwater is high. I think it was within two to three feet of the ground. So dewatering might be a consistent effort on this project. And and there are cases where they actually truck the dumpsters offsite altogether. Um, so they yeah. might lower the water level and take the water and the tailings and everything goes offsite. So that's also an option. Okay, so this is uh, the point at which if there are no more commissioner comments or questions, um, I seek a motion. Shall I read the motion? I move to close the public hearing and issue order of conditions for 110 North Service Road, DEP number 089-0743, excuse me, with the standard boilerplate conditions under both the MA Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and Regulations, and with the noted additional conditions. Is there a second? A second. Uh, the vote then, uh, Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Rachel? Aye. And I also am an aye. Thank you, Josna, and the applicants for attending this evening. I appreciate your work and um, We'll see you. Uh, I, some of us may come to these meetings, but we'll see you out on the ground. That sounds great. Thank you very much Thank for having you. us. Appreciate your time. We're going to move now to the hearing number five, which is an amended notice of intent. Um, the Pure Sky Energy for changes to the approved construction sequencing in the existing order of conditions for solar facility, which is currently under construction, as well as additional proposed grading in buffer zone and land subject to flooding at 191 West Pomeroy Lane, map 19D, lot 10. I believe that uh, several things have occurred in the very recent past. So uh, Aaron, if you could give the staff report first so we know where we are with this one, uh, and then we can proceed. Yeah, so just, um, Bruce, um, just as a reminder, we have to read the hearing call for this one because this one's I'm opening sorry. today. No, no, that's okay. You're doing great. You're, you're doing fantastic, honestly. He blew it in the last minute. Okay, for tonight, this is um, this hearing is, be held, is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act Relative to the Protection of Wetlands as most recently amended and Article 3.31, wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. Um, and then I've already, the amended, this is an amended notice of intent um, for Pure Sky Energy for changes to the approved construction sequencing in the existing order of conditions for the solar facility, which is currently under construction, as well as additional proposed grading in the buffer zone land subject to flooding at 191 West Pomeroy Lane map 19D lot 10. So, um, Aaron, please guide us. 
Yep. So I'm going to um, welcome uh, Lawrence in and any other folks who um, want to uh, speak for the um, as a representative of the applicant. Um, so I'll just give a quick um, a quick update to the commission on this. Um, Can you let Sean Foster in, oh, please? Yeah. Sorry about that, uh, Miss Sean. Okay. Um, So there's a there's a couple pieces to this um, because this project is located in natural heritage and endangered species area and there's a conservation management plan associated with the project. Um, natural heritage has to approve of the amendments um, before the Commission can actually take action on it. Um, and then there's another piece of this, which is that. So the CMP, which was originally created define C sorry so, define what a cmp is yeah so cmp is a conservation management plan um there is a a very significant conservation management plan which was approved by um uh, natural heritage and endangered species program back uh, i want to say 2018 um the the plan was probably put together 2017 2018 um uh, with a very significant um restoration plan which is associated with the project development it's a approximately 17 acre um, uh, mitigation area which is located north of the fort river i do have a, a map i can show you the location but to make a long story short when the project when the cmp was designed um, the conditions on the ground were that of a recently uh, abandoned golf course. And now six, seven years later, um, the conditions that we're seeing are a fully rebounding early succession habitat. So we're seeing a lot of woody vegetation reestablishing a lot of natives and a lot of invasives. So as we're, as the, the contractor who was hired to um, begin initiating the conservation management plan has been out boots on the ground. They've discovered that the conditions on the ground have changed pretty dramatically from when the plan was put together. And so part of that is them revising this plan in order to address the additional invasives which have started to take over the mitigation area as well as um, modifying the planting plan in order to accommodate the um, native species which have started to, to um, come back in on the site as succession is kind of taking place. So the applicant has been working with natural heritage to get this revised, but in order, it's kind of like the cart before the horse. We, we have to say we're in favor based on the conditions that natural heritage approve of their change to the conservation management plan based on the revised site conditions in order for natural heritage to act on that piece as well as on their amendment of the request. So my recommendation for the board tonight is basically to, to hear from the applicant about what the changes, you know, if they wanna go into more depth than what I already have about what the changes to the CMP are um, so that the Conservation Commission can approve those changes. That way natural heritage can basically begin and complete their review, hopefully before the next meeting. Um, and the applicant is here. And again, I'll, I'll leave it at their discretion uh, with regard to other discussions um, on, the, on the proposed um, plan changes. But just knowing that we don't have a full contingent of board members here tonight, we have a, a kind of a, um, a small group. So the, whatever you say this time around, you know, if just want to be cautious of that for quorum reasons and making sure everybody knows what's going on. So my interest here is to uh, take the actions that we need to take in order for the state uh, program to make a decision as rapidly as possible. Since key members of this commission are not here, I'd like to hold discussions and detail about other aspects of the project that need review until they are here, because we'll just have to go over it again. So uh, let's see, Sean, Lawrence, and Tom, could you, uh, speak to the question of of the things we need, uh, need to do concerning their conservation management plan. Sure. And so if I could, uh, Mr. Chair, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson on the Amherst, uh, and I was involved back in 2018, 2019, when this was originally approved. Um, 
and then amended then by it was Barry Roberts at that time. And so, yeah, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, what we're going to do is push off the grading and phasing discussion to December 4th when you. hopefully you've got a full complement of, of the board. Uh, and we've had discussions with Division of Fisheries and Wildlife and HESP, and they've supported um, the grading and the phasing changes. We're looking to get that in writing. We've also been in touch with them about the CMP changes, and, and they're also supportive of those, but they, they need your vote um, to somewhat galvanize that. And so, I mean, Aaron did a terrific job, as always, about identifying those changes. It really is a function of the time that has passed since this was originally approved to where we are now and what nature has done to the site. And so, you know, increasing the size of the invasive uh, plant management area, uh, postponing native plant things, and then just conducting invasive plant management efficiently while reducing the impact on wood turtles. Like those are the kind of the three main categories that the CMP would be changed uh, by and NHESP has been supportive of it. So, I mean, we can get into as much detail as you want on that. Um, but that's kind of the, the, the broad brush of what we're looking to do. So Aaron has put up a map that shows the mitigation area. For reference, where is the clubhouse? Aaron, right there, okay. All right, any other uh, thoughts or comments from either of the other two applicants, Sean or Lawrence? Um, or do you have anything to add? No, I mean, the the only thing that I would add is that we can discuss uh, a little bit about the grading and um, uh, uh, and the phasing changes if we want the, uh, the notice of uh, this being the I meeting. really want to hold those till we have a full complement of the commission. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, are there questions or comments from the public that we would entertain now? Okay, uh, Commissioner, comments, questions? I guess from uh, Rachel and then I'll, I'll give one. I just had a question. It sounds like they're um, needing to use chemicals to help help with a lot of the invasive management. A lot of the original stuff was just really a labor and cost prohibitive and the invasive species are out of kind of out of control as they do. Um, just wondering, are the chemicals appropriate for um, wetland areas or resource areas? This one, one of the question I had. Yeah, and so um, we've heard back from Ms. Deanne over at uh, Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, and she said they don't object to the use of, and I'm not even going to try, try yeah. club. Thank you, yeah, or uh, glyphosate for the proposed work, and it makes sense given the conditions observed. Uh, they also don't object to the delay of plantings, and then they talked about no surface herbicides applied between the third week of May, which is nesting, through September 15th, which is ha hatching, um, for the protection of the eggs and hatchlings unless the ground surface can be temporarily covered for a brief period to avoid thermal changes. Uh, surface here would mean anything that would sit on the leaves, um, and then they wanted some visual sweep to avoid turtles in the area mm -hmm. as well. So we've vetted it by them and they're okay with that. And and just to, to add some additional color to that, the, the use of herbicides was previously discussed at Concom and approved to deal with the CMP. Um, the, uh, the changes are that some of the invasive species, which were highlighted as uh, more uh, like pulling and things like that, some of them have been observed on site. They're just too small to deal with by, by pulling um, and they will need a, um, the, the, the herbicide application. So that that's where the amendment is there rather than uh, using them when we weren't intending to. Alex? Yeah, with regard to herbicides, there are herbicides that we have approved on other projects recently that are not glycophase based. And on another project, we asked that glycophase based herbicides not be used. So to be consistent with what we've been doing lately, I would ask that you not use glycophase based herbicides, but rather rely on others that are available. And matter of fact, the others that are not glycophase based 
in the project that I'm referring to, they were used, the ones that are not echo face based, they were used closer to the wetland. Um, so it, just, okay. to, just to finish that out, uh, on the previous project, it did not interfere with the foliage uh, applications that you're looking for at all, and the applicant did not object to that. So I guess we're going to rely on Aaron to, to show that information to the applicant so they have an understanding of what uh, the details of what Alex is talking about. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, to some degree, um, I know, and this is just to, to speak from my experience dealing with um, herbicide treatment in and around wetland areas, I do know that rodeo, which is a variant of glyphosate, is one of the very much relied upon um, uh, uh, treatments in and around wetland areas because it's uh, considered to be more um, appropriate for use near wetlands. So I guess um, I hear what Alex is saying, and I know that there's a lot of movement away from use of glyphosate, but that we might want to yield to natural heritage in terms of what they recommend, just because they're, um, I think, a little more from a biology standpoint, um, going to be guiding sort of the approval of the CMP in terms of what's going to be appropriate for applications that are going to affect the organisms on the site. Um, so, you know, I, I guess that's just sort okay. of the, well, my only, my request um, to Tom and the clients is that we find a way to have a member of the commission out there while this, these applications are being done so that we can see the, the, and to make as much as possible, as minimal as possible, a use of these herbicides. Um, I'm not going to vote to not have them at all, but I want to have some monitoring of it while it's happening. Alex. Yeah, the monitoring just to watch the application go on doesn't doesn't to me that's not satisfactory. I'd rather be consistent and ask and appreciate uh, Aaron contradicting what I said. But I would ask that she simply go into the um, conditions that we approved for the project I'm referring to and tell Lawrence what the herbicide was that we approved, and that that. That worked out just fine for that project. And then uh, I, with all due respect to um, the natural heritage, um, there is a move away from glycophase, which is widespread. And um, if other herbicides are available, which they were on the project I'm referring to, why not tell Lawrence and, and Tom and the others what that was and let them uh, think about it themselves? So let's see, we're gonna go to Aaron, just any additional, and then Lawrence, I see your hand. So um, I guess I just wanted to clarify that my comment wasn't meant to contradict Alex's comment. The, the specific difference between the previous site where we, um, didn't want glyphosate used versus this site is that this is this site is almost entirely within natural heritage and endangered species area versus the other site which didn't have that level of regulatory oversight so um, if if natural heritage is okay with us not using that then I'm completely good with that but if na if natural heritage came back and said that was the only, chemical application that they were okay with out there or that it needed to be used for some reason. I'm a, I am just concerned about that um, directive to the applicant directly conflicting with what Heritage is saying. So just putting that out there, but I can have a conversation with Ms. Deanne and see if there are other chemical um, treatments that Heritage is okay with considering the sensitivity of the site. Okay. So, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Aaron didn't adjust my, my, my ask, and that was to go into the other project, which I'm not going to name because she knows exactly which one it is, 
and tell Lawrence and Tom and Sean what that other herbicide is and let them put that in their application to natural heritage. And um, I, with all due respect, uh, it's not gonna change my mind. Well, let me ask a, a, a direct question. Aaron, is that problematic for you just to give them the information? Okay, so do that. Then Dave, is, is your hand up because this is specifically about this before, because Lawrence has been waiting for a while and I want it, and I also don't want this conversation to go on and on and on. So I'm happy to go after Lawrence. He is the applicant. Okay, Lawrence. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it was just two things. We're, we're obviously happy to consider anything that's effective um, to protect the resource. I'm happy to consider alternatives. Um, the inspection is also not an issue. The only thing that I would say is I would appreciate um, uh, some uh, some responsiveness on that. We. Uh, we, when we apply the herbicides, it will be during certain weather conditions. Um, and so we, we may only have a couple of days window at a time to be able to apply it. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to have to um, postpone for several weeks if, uh, uh, if it was taking sort of five days to get somebody to, to be able to come to site. Um, so just uh, if, if that can be uh, considered as well um, when we're when we're calling for the uh, for the oversight there but uh, it'll have to have okay. training etc well I know we rely on Aaron to do the best she can with scheduling and getting um, the, the state departments to actually actively talk with her in a timely way so we will do our best on that uh, Dave yeah a couple of things um i think it's fine for aaron to provide that in information to tom and to lawrence about the other uh, permitted project that you just uh issued your order of conditions on i would just i would just i guess recommend that it would be up to the applicant to communicate with natural heritage to see if that is whatever that uh, herbicide is is a is an acceptable um uh, alternative. I, I I would prefer that, you know, they report to Aaron what they hear from Natural Heritage and, and we work it that way. I think it's more, it's incumbent upon the applicant to, to, to do that legwork and I'm sure they're prepared to do that. Um, in terms of having a commission member out there for all of the application of the uh, herbicide, um, that's a pretty unusual I'll withdraw it. I just, I would like some monitoring of the process. I think that's fine. Typically, that would fall to the wetlands administrator to be there. I, okay. I don't have a big issue, but I, I, I hear what Lawrence is saying that, you know, schedules are important, timing is important, and when they need to go based on weather conditions. All right. So uh, fine with that. Um, I did want to ask Tom, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to read all the material for tonight, but I know in the uh, in, in what you're requesting with Natural Heritage that planting of replanting with natives is postponed. Um, is there a timeline for that? And also, do the number of natives proposed to be planted, is that the same as what was previously proposed? Great question. So I think... Um... The recommendation from uh, SWCA was to pause the planting until at least two years of invasive managements have been completed just because it's so overrun. Uh, they're gonna do a year end report after the 2025 management season to talk about the status of the invasives as well as continued native free generation. And, I'll, and they'll identify areas that have not been populated with native vegetations and are suitable for restoration plantings uh, among other recommendations. And Lawrence, I don't know if, because I think the original was like 948 trees, 948 shrubs. And Lawrence, I don't know if you know if that's the same or it's going to change based upon, I, I would I would assume it's going to change based upon what's actually out there. And if there's already natives naturally growing, maybe it's not forcing uh, new natives in. But Lawrence, I don't know if you know the answer to that piece. So it, 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 you're, you're right. It, it, it's going to be um, based on the conditions when uh, when we uh, come to the end of that pause. Um, but uh, we, if, if uh, we're not intending to, to reduce any uh, that, that, that are not deemed necessary or anything. Um, so okay. it'll, it'll just be a 
let's have a look at it at the end of 2025 and uh, we, we'll come up with a plan then. Sure. Great. I just, um, to, if I could, Bruce, I just wanted to note that tonight and, and have that continue to come up. I mean, obviously we have a restoration plan for the entire 150 acres and that 17 acres on the north side of the um, river are obviously critical to habitat. And I think we'd like to see a more consistent canopy uh, uh, develop on that side to provide all the benefits that that will for the Fort River. So just noting it, and I'm glad okay. things changed there. Thank you. Alex, briefly. I'm always, Are you still I'm always brief. <laughs> OK. When uh, I just wanted to say that the other project that we've been referring to, they had a waiting period very similar to what's being proposed. Okay. Um, and, and Lawrence, and we dealt with that before where they want to postpone plantings until they can get the invasives under speed under control. So we've all, we've seen almost the exact same proposal very recently. So we would ask that you take a hard look at that. Um, I want just one minute, Aaron. Can you put the map back up? Yes. So it looks to me as though there are within this zone, there are a number of sand traps. And it's my understanding, and Dave can correct me, but my understanding is there is a very um, considered plan for keeping the sand traps, some, if not all of them, open by hand pulling to prevent them from going through uh, succession so that the sand is available for the wood turtles to lay their eggs. To the extent that the, that there are sand traps in this particular zone, I would very much like to see the activity in those traps be the same as the ones in the rest of Hickory Ridge. So let's go to Dave's comment and then back to Lawrence. Yeah, so very briefly, um, Bruce, it's a good point. I think that's an evolving conversation with folks from Mass Fish and Wildlife at okay. the level. Uh, not all the sand traps are created equal, if you will, <laughs> well, fair the enough. turtles, and particularly ones in the floodplain. So we, okay. Aaron and I, are continuing to have conversations with the uh, turtle experts at the state, and so we can come back to you on that and and get back. That's all I'm asking is careful consideration, and I'm sure the golfers would agree with you that not all sand traps are the same. <laughs> uh, Lawrence. Yeah, it, it's just that we're not uh, proposing that we're going to um, do any changes with the bunkers at all. Um, the bunkers are the the, uh, the plan for the bunkers is that uh, they get um, some sand or um, other suitable material to kind of make them into a, a, a mound, so they aren't untouched. Um, uh, but we are uh, we are still going to be dealing with the bunkers. There's no change there. Okay. All right. Well, I just want to make sure that the that the turtles see <laughs> the most. Um valuable habitat as they can for egg laying going down the road. All right, let's see if there's any members of the public with any last questions or comments. Uh, seeing none, I would, so we have two motions, Aaron, please confirm that there's one to support the changes that have been discussed here um, with the conservation management plan. Yes, so that would be the first motion, um, which, yeah, to support the changes to the okay. CMP as proposed. And I, um, you know, we can certainly incorporate um, the, um, I don't know how you want to describe it, suggestion or um, requirement that, that Alex referenced with regard to yes. the, the treatments. Okay. Um, and then the other is just to continue us to the <clears throat> next meeting. Do you continue want two motions or one, just the two of them combined? Um, two, two separate motions, I think, okay. would make sense. I'd like to get a motion on, to move the support changes to the CMP as proposed, including um, the uh, recommendation that alternative herbicides be strongly considered. Um, Non-glycophase, please. Non-glycophase uh, herbicides be con strongly considered. And do I have a, um, a motion to that effect from any of the commissioners? So moved. Uh, Jason, on the, uh, on the motion, do I have a second? Second. 
Alex, uh, the vote. Um, Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. And Jason? Aye. Then I'm an aye. Do I have a motion to, excuse me? Bruce, can I interrupt for just one second? Yeah, um, we should, we, we, did we already take public comment on this? I well, I attempted to. I okay. asked if anybody okay. had a comment and no one raised their hand. So okay, great. I I'll do it again for sure. this one. Are there any other public comments that I might have missed? Okay, seeing none. Alex, is your hand still up or up again? It's up again. <laughs> I need to make a comment before we go to the next motion. Please do. So that has to do with fences and uh, two things. One is the fence and the fact that it's supposed to be a minimum of eight inches off the ground. And I went out there and took a whole bunch of pictures, probably 20 pictures, and the fence is on the ground, in the ground, and substantially less than eight inches in lots of spots. And also the herbs, the herbs, the, 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 the herbaceous material at the base of the plant is almost impenetrable. So if the purpose of keeping the fence off the ground is to allow turtles to wander around, there's got to be something, in, and I'm sorry, I didn't look back to see what is in the plan to keep the herbaceous material out from underneath the bottom of the fence. But that whole fencing thing needs to be in your proposal for our consideration, please. So that okay. the existing fence needs to be corrected and the future fence needs to be at least, and I, I would rather say stay with at least, because that means it can be higher than, I assume that fence is to keep people out. So we don't want people rolling under the fence, but it, it that's a kind of a, a factor. But, uh, and the other thing is I noticed that in the weekly SWIFT reports that the comments about erosion control and whatnot uh, went on week after week and weren't fixed. And in the most recent SWIFT report, it looks like a bunch of stuff got done. But uh, that that report goes to Dave Zomack, who purports to be the project manager. And he's a busy guy. Um, I would propose that the SWIFT monitor or some other monitor paid for by Pure Sky have his duties expanded so that he's looking at not just wetlands and erosion control, but looking at other permit conditions to keep an eye on that for Aaron and Dave to make sure that we stay on track. Okay, since we're continuing the public hearing to December 4th, is that a topic that can get uh, addressed by the staff in the meantime? Yeah, Okay. I just want to get it out on the table yeah. and bring it up at the next meeting. Fair that enough. Them that gives them time to talk about it, think about it. Okay. Come back with a proposal. Don't need to talk about it all <laughs> tonight. Just want right. to get it out there. Okay, Aaron, very quickly, and then I'm, I'm seeking a motion. Yes. I just wanted to say with regard to the monitoring reports, it when I get those reports, usually my first response is to reach out to Pure Sky and Jake and say, hey, guys, let me know when these um you know, adjustments have been made so I can come out and take a look at them. It does sometimes take a couple days. So like if the report is done on a Thursday and the repairs aren't made until the following uh -huh. Thursday, sometimes it carries over week to week, but I do try to um, communicate with them and get those adjustments made quickly, but um, just point, okay. just to point out that I, that I am paying attention and that when I see that, I usually send those notices to the, contractor to fix. Okay. All right. I'm looking for a motion to continue the public hearing to December 4th, 2024 at 7 30 p.m. Second. Uh, I didn't get a motion. Oh, I no? move to continue the public hearing to December 4, 2024 at 7 30 p.m. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any public comment? Okay, the vote. Um, Rachel? Aye. Uh, Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. 
And I also vote yes. And thank you, gentlemen, for attending. Thank you, members of the public, for observing. Um, and now, Aaron, is there anything else under other business that we should be doing? Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Tom. Um, Thanks, Lawrence. Sean. So um, just to point out to the commission that uh, there was quite a bit of correspondence that came in um, and just, you know, that there, there are other items that weren't on the agenda that aren't in the um, PowerPoint presentation tonight. Um, one of them in particular was a, um, a, a homeowner at 137 Stanley Street who um, believes the work they're doing is outside of jurisdiction, but it just gave a courtesy notification that there is some work going on there and they're adjacent to conservation land and they're going to be putting in erosion control. So just to point out that periodically we get um, you know, other correspondence and that there's no action required by the board, but just um, as you're reviewing your packets that um, to be aware of that. Hey, I have a, a question from the past, but Jason first. Yeah, just Aaron, in reading that, they believe they're not doing anything. How are we, how do we know that? And what is the, what is the kind of, process to either confirm that they are or they are not doing any work yeah so they reached out to me um and i happen to be really familiar with that area um and they provided a diagram of where the um, excavation was going to be located i've actually <laughs> delineated portions of the conservation area myself um, in that area and also just being very familiar with where the resource areas were located. I was able to take some measurements to determine that I believe that the work is outside of jurisdiction and just said, you know, because of the proximity, it's in a very visible location right adjacent to the parking area. You're um, immediately abutting a conservation area that I just recommended a courtesy notification to the CONCOM, even though all work is proposed to be out of jurisdiction. And also I told them to install erosion controls as well. So um, that's kind of the general procedure, but like if there was any, if there was any suspicion that they were in jurisdiction, I would put them on a different course. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry, Bruce, I just have a follow-up. And it's yeah. not related necessarily to this, but, you know, Aaron, with um, with this information being collected for each project that comes in front of the Conservation Commission, is anyone, is there a GIS layer that's actually storing all of these delineations so that maybe at one point in time we have a full town-wide delineation? That's a great question. Um, so... If I can, I do. Um, if it's available, I do. And for larger projects, like for example, the Eversource right of way project, I asked for um, all of their GIS data. Um, for, and there are instances where I actually um, uh, georeference plans myself and delineate where the wetlands are so I can take my own measurements and, and look at it based on what I know. Um, but it is, if, I have contemplated when we do another round of revisions to our bylaw regulations requiring that applicants submit a, um, a digital file, whether it be a, a CAD file or a GIS file, so that we can do that. And I did do something similar in another community I worked for, and it was really, really powerful. Um, so I, I think it's a great suggestion. I've thought of it myself um, and thought it would be a great thing to incorporate. Um, it's just... Um, it hasn't made it in the regs yet. And so I, I hunt and peck and request it where I can, but it's not an expectation that people submit it to us. Thank you. Hey, um, any last comments from the public? Anything we went over too quickly or something you, that you'd like us to uh, discuss? Um, any last comments from the commissioners? And then I'll entertain a, mo a motion to adjourn. Rachel. Um, I'm lucky this discussion about the wetlands data collection mapping. Um, I'm wondering if if an you know some of the projects that require as-built 
um, if, if, you know, having a, the digital form of the wetlands in that as built could be a way to standardize that across at least the majority of projects. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right, I still need a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. The time is now 8.52. I second. Uh, Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. I also want to thank Rachel and, and in particular who help, is taking some notes in my on my behalf. I'll consolidate what I did, Rachel and Aaron's notes and, and uh, do a better job of getting these out to you more in a more timely way. I will simply comment that there was this thing about a week ago and it kind of it distracted the mind for a while. So you did a great job tonight, Bruce. Yeah, awesome yeah. Job tonight. Thank, Thank you so yep. much. Good all job. Right. I will I will miss all of you till we meet again. <laughs> all right. Take care. We're gonna are you closing, Aaron? Yes. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.